Watkins Glen had a bit of everything. Playoff implications, Hawaiian pretzel bites, and Harrison Burton potentially ruining the end of this race. Welcome back to Break Hard. I'm Matt. Watkins Glen. I know every time we have a race, we're like, oh, I had a bit of everything that happened in it. Watkins Glen did legit have a bit of everything because it was unlike most of the Gen 7 races that we've seen on road courses so far. And it absolutely devolved into idiocracy levels of stupidness at the end of this race, which is kind of what you come to expect when you have a late race caution on a road course, especially in the playoffs. Things are going to get a little bit out of hand. Off the top, was this a good race? I'm probably going to give it an 82. It was fine. The battle at the end between Chris Buescher and Shane Van Gisbergen was really good. Uh, for all the hype that we had about the Tigers coming into this race and all the fall off, we're going to see three seconds uh, a run and everything like that. It just felt like tires were really never that big of a factor. I mean, heck, Raj Chassain and Shane Van Gisbergen stayed on old tires and they were able to hold off guys on newer tires for a lot of laps, over 12 laps probably at that point. And then once they finally got around them, those guys pitted and it just really wasn't that much of a disparity in tires, I think, as some people were, were hoping for, myself included. I was hoping that Goodyear had brought a tire that was going to be really interesting and make this race more interesting as well. Remember, you can call and leave me a voicemail. Give me your reactions to today's races, the NASCAR races, the IndyCar race, the Formula One race. Does not matter. Call me at 5 513-445-9809. Leave your name, where you're from, and what you want to talk about, and I'll include it in the Break Hard Show this week. But this race got off to a bang right out of the gates because a couple weeks ago at Michigan, Denny Hamlin said that Corey LaJoy was just out of control, man. And on lap one, going into the bus stop, what happens? Corey LaJoy decides to jump over the curb, getting into the bus stop, and he clobbers the eight car of Kyle Busch who collects Christopher Bell as well as Denny Hamlin in the process. Ricky Stenhouse Jr. also collected smashes in the wall, destroyed an NBC camera. Uh, at least he's not destroying race cars for once, so there's a positive to come out of that. But Denny Hamlin makes contact with the eight car on the right front and absolutely destroyed the right front of that car. He was crab walking down the straightaway trying to get back to pit lane to which I believe Jeff Burton said, maybe he just has a flat tire. Nah, that's typically not what flat tires look like. In that same accident, Ryan Blaney makes it through then makes contact with the 42 of John Hunter Nemechek, just slight contact on the left front, broke the steering on the car. Blaney's stuck on the track. They come and hook him up. They take him back to pit road. And NASCAR's trying to take him behind the wall. Blaney wants to be taken to his pit box. And as the wrecker's trying to pull him behind the wall, he's slamming on the brake, jerking himself around in the car. And NASCAR was like, no, dude, your day's done. And Blaney got out of that car. And he was absolutely fuming, frustrated. He was furious. And Ryan Blaney... Typically outside the car never really shows like that level of frustration and emotion, but you could see it like just seething through him and it sucked because his day was done very early, but thankfully he has Atlanta to fall back on after he got caught up in an accident there. He rebounded for a second place finish. So that really helps him out in terms of the points for Denny Hamlin getting caught up in that first lap incident after the absolutely terrible terrible race strategy he had in Atlanta last week has put him below the cutoff line. He is now uh, looking at what minus six below the cutoff line heading into Bristol. Good thing for him. He has won the last few races at Bristol, so he should be feeling pretty good about advancing on if he can have a good run on Saturday night for the Bristol night race. But after we get all of that cleaned up on lap number one, we go back to racing and going through turn one after the restart, AJ Allmendinger comes out of the corner and that car looked like it just stopped. He gets ran into the back of by, or he, he gets ran into by Joey Logano. Thankfully, nobody wrecked there. Logano didn't really get that much damage. And Almendinger gets out of the car and talks to TV. And he's like, I think that the axle came apart from the transaxle, which is not ideal. And it sucks for him because then he had to sit around and watch his colleague teammate uh, in SVG contend for the win. I say that in quotations because that car that SVG was driving was entered by colleague, but that's a track house car, if we're being completely honest here. There's a reason those track house cars were very fast on Sunday and AJ, we unfortunately never got to see, but the other car that they had over at Cog, Daniel Hemrick, he was a heat seeking missile all day. That guy was just looking for somebody. The body craves contact. Daniel Hemrick craved contact on Sunday because he was running into everybody. Bodied Austin Cindric. He just cooked it into turn one like, oh, crap, I forgot. There is a right-hander coming up right here. I thought it was a left, and bodies the uh, two-car of Austin Cindric. He then dumps Hasgrawl a little bit later in the race. Just kind of chaotic all around. And then in stage uh, number one, Ross Chastain do dominates that stage. Pitts, though, after leading the first 18 laps, hands over the lead. Martin Trex Jr. takes the stage win. He needed those 10 points. He needed that playoff point. He is in a 
must win situation more than likely heading into Bristol. I say must win. He's only 14 points below the cutoff, but as bad as that team has run this year, they need to win. Like, cause I don't think they are capable of just like running a solid top five at this point. On the restart for the start of stage number two, Tyler Reddick gets spun going down in or through turn one. And that was just the start of a bad day for him. That 45 team, 20 or 11 racing in general was just out to lunch. I don't know if it's the, if it's the distraction from the charter uh, negotiations, but Denny Hamlin ran terrible last week in Atlanta. He ran terrible again this weekend. 2311 racing looks completely distracted out there. Tyler Reddick has never qualified outside the top 10 on a road course in the Gen 7 era. That happened this weekend. Bubble Wallace was a non-factor all day. At one point, he was running like 32nd, which is just unacceptable for how fast those cars typically are. Then, towards the end of that stage, you have Rasha Singh dominating, Shane Van Gisbergen just riding in second, continually telling the team every time they ask, how's the car? And he says, really, really good. Just really good. Uh, don't change a thing to it. Kind of felt like he was just riding, kind of biding his time here. And as they're about to come to pit road, they're pitting this lap. Daniel Suarez, their track house teammate, beaches it down into turn six and nascar throws the caution keep in mind nascar had been holding the caution through this pit cycle because of a tire that was left on pit road uh it was laying out in the pit lane and they're gonna let the cycle go through daniel suarez touches gravel and immediately comes to a stop caution is out now don't get me wrong i understand it daniel suarez is in a very precarious situation where he was at if NASCAR had waited five seconds, allowed those two to get to pit lane, it would have been a complete cycle at that point. And instead, they throw the caution. And that really screwed up the uh, one car of Ross Chastain and the 16 car of SVG. Now, instead of being able to flip the stage, they decide to stay out. Chastain wins stage number two. SVG gets second. And then they decided to run that run that, uh, run long. Uh, that fuel run, they were going to take it all the way to the end uh, of that stint. Then on lap 59, uh, they did pit at that point, which would have been uh, just about 31 laps left in that race. So they finally come to pit road and pit then. And that's where you saw like the tires not really being that big of a factor because those guys were out on old tires. You had guys on new tires behind them and they weren't really able to pass them until one lap before they decided to dive into the pits. And it's like, oh man, I just wanted a little bit, a little bit more tire fall off. Uh, before those guys pitted though, we had a very, very weird situation where Kyle Larson got a penalty on pit road and he was back in the pack. He and Brad Keselowski decided to have like a PP measuring contest for like 27th place. And Brad takes him all the way down to the grass going into the final corner uh, of the lap, which is stupid in its own right. Then going down into the S's, those two are still side by side. Denny Hamlin's just trying to limp around and salvage a day. Those probably didn't realize that he was outside three wide right there. Brad makes contact with him, sends the 11 off into the wall. Denny gets absolutely junked. Just a horrible day for him all around. Thankfully for him, the chaos at the end of the race kind of saved his day just a little bit because at one point he was like minus 20 outside the cut line, which is not ideal because that really would have been a must win probably for him next weekend at Bristol. Then on lap 62, as we're going through this pit cycle, Chris uh, Christopher Bell just gets absolutely dunked by Austin Dillon, who thought he was still back at Richmond. He wasn't, obviously, it actually wasn't Austin Dillon's fault. Chris Buescher was trying to pit from, like, the racing line and trying to hook, uh, hook a dead right to get to pit road. That was bad overall. And then with, like, 17 laps to go, Daniel Hemrick, like I was talking about before, absolutely junked Kaz Grala, like he was trying out for the Buffalo Bills and just punted him in the final uh, corner of the lap. Not really sure what that whole situation was about. And then on lap 80, Harrison Butker Burton, trying to make himself relevant, Goes out there and blows a tire and absolutely threw this entire race into chaos like he was a Walmart sign last weekend in Atlanta. And he robbed us of what could have been an interesting finish. Just once, I want to see a natural finish on these races because you have two different strategies. Would SEG been able to catch the uh, 17 car of Chris Busher? They were actually on the same strategy, um, but it would have been interesting to see how all that played out because he was catching Busher at about two to four tenths a lap. And with the gap that he had, which was a little under four seconds at that point with 10 laps to go, he had a chance to get there probably with two, maybe one lap to go. Would have been interesting to just see if he was going to be able to catch him and instead we're going to get a late race restart and you all know what that means go ahead and put all the body armor on that you can get your car ready because we're going to absolute war on the ensuing restart exactly what we just talked about happened chaos ensued as william byron and brad kozlowski made contact byron went up in the air into the armco and came to a stop with the side of his car the front of his car in the side of the six car like in the window net just really wanted those hawaiian pretzel bites and brad's like god dang dude there's an easier way to do this 
person trying to shove a Camaro into the side of my head. Byron then backed up and dropped himself down off the side of the six car who had the Chevy bow tie right into the B pillar of that Ford Mustang. Scary situation. Both of them were okay. Thankfully, there was double armco there as Steve Tart pointed out, because if not, Byron goes into the fence and we're sitting here under a red flag until Sunday night football is about to start because that would have taken a long time to clean up from at that point. Finally, we get back to racing after that caution. Tyler Reddick and Chris, or Kyle Busch get together. NASCAR throws a caution immediately. I would argue that they maybe could have held it in that situation, but those two wrecks, Josh Berry gets on the wall thanks to help from Chase Elliott. That stacked everybody up, and that's what caused the Tyler Reddick-Kyle Busch situation back there. Like I said at the beginning, this race devolved into idiocracy very fast. The only thing we were missing is like Terry Crews out there as president. But overall, it was stupid there at the end. Maybe it's time that we look at single file restarts within the final 10 laps of the race, kind of take a page out of some of what dirt racing does because it just does not create entertaining racing and all it does is destroy race cars and make everybody kind of look like fools in a sense. But I understand it's entertainment and people were certainly entertained. On the final restart of the race, so Chris, uh, Chris Busher's leading. Carson Hosevar in second to his outside. Shane Van Gisbergen lined up in third behind Busher, and he kept doing that. Even when he was in second place, he lined up behind Busher because he didn't trust Carson Hosevar to not go bowling down into turn one, which was smart on his part. You can't trust him. At this point, he did run a good race, so at the end, so hats off to Carson Hosevar for that. On the restart, though, SUG makes slight contact with the 17 getting into turn one, not really that much contact at all, is able to get past him. And it's like, oh, man, SUG is about to win his second ever NASCAR Cup Series race. And then he takes the white flag going around. You're like, all right, he's halfway home going into the bus stop, blows the bus stop. Just carried way too much speed in there, hit that inside curb, bottomed out, allowed the 17 car to get alongside him going into the carousel. There's contact made there. 17 clears him, takes the lead. SVG tried to get back to him, just couldn't. Had a heck of a save going down into that final corner. And Chris Busher picks up his first win of the season. First time that RFK has had two cars win in the same season since 2013. Hats off to them for getting that done. That's good for the company all around. Uh, obviously, Busher's not in the playoffs, but he wanted to go out there and get a win. He did it. He is a good road racer. He won it on road courses in the Xfinity Series. Never got that in the Cup Series up until this point. But for Busher, massive win for him. For RFK, it's huge. And now we head into Bristol next Saturday night with an interesting point stand. Obviously, Busher winning means that a playoff driver did not lock into the second round. So currently, the cut line is Ty Gibbs, the last car in at plus six. He is tied with Chase Briscoe, who's also plus six. Briscoe does have the tie breaker because he does have a victory this season. Denny Hamlin, first driver out at six below. Brad Keselowski, 12 below. Martin Truex Jr., 14 below. And Harrison Burton, 20 points below the cutoff line. Right now, I would put money on Denny Hamlin and Brad Keselowski advancing out and probably Ty Gibbs and Chase Briscoe falling out. That's kind of how I'm feeling about it right now. Uh, interchangeable, I would say that I think Ty Gibbs might have a better chance of advancing uh, and Chase Briscoe falling out and, you know, Denny Hamlin making it in with Brad being out as well. But overall, that's where we're at at currently, and it has been an absolutely chaotic race at Watkins Glen. Let me know in the comments what you think about it. Like and subscribe to the channel. Follow me on TikTok at Card, Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook at Card Blog.